We welcome you back to another episode of Inside Boxing Live. It is Dan Canobio, Earthquake Survivor, and Chris Algieri, Eclipse Enjoyer. That's why I'm starting this episode off for another episode of Inside Boxing Live presented by PPV.com. Chris, I survived an earthquake. I'm just as tough as you. I don't care how many eye sockets you broke. I don't care how many world titles you've won. I'm now on your level of, of toughness. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've only survived two earthquakes when I was in Las Vegas and one in California. Um, but they weren't they weren't four point eights. So, dude, I know this is like kind of old news, and it, and and I don't know who who I'm sure we have a lot of listeners in the in the eastern tri state area. That was weird. I'm not from LA. I've never experienced the uh, earthquake. Big before. deal for us. Big big deal big, for us East Coasters. Big deal. I'm sitting on I'm at my kitchen. I'm getting some work done on my kitchen island, and the whole apartment starts shaking. I was like, is, is this the end? Is this it? And then I went out, ran outside, and typical New York fashion, everyone's in the streets going, "Yo, you feel that? Yo, I'm looking at my neighbor. Like, Yo, you feel that?" And this one guy's like, "I told you it was an earthquake. I told you to his boy. He's like, you owe me a coffee.' It was the most New York thing for. <laughs> and then I just, you owe me a bagel. <laughs> yeah, and that's that. So that was a weird Friday. It was a weird weekend. Didn't have a ton of boxing. We'll, we'll break down some of that. Uh, what we saw. Saturday night in Las Vegas at the Fountain Blue. But, yeah, strange stuff. Got the solar eclipse. Uh, hopefully we survive that. If not, we had a good run. We had a good run uh, here at uh, Inside Boxing Live. It's been uh, three, almost 300 episodes. So if we don't make it out of these end times that we're in, then, uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. And thank you, PPV.com. Thank you to my family. Thank you, Chris, for, for hopping on this podcast. I'm going to survive, so, you know, I'll, I'll carry on. Well, you're a survivor, yeah. What are you saying? Yeah. I'm like a week. Like if if we were on an island, I would die first. I, uh, I mean, what, what, what can you do? I mean, I don't, we don't need we don't need Laughter? podcasting. We don't need Laughter? podcasting skills and, and compu box on the island. I can supply moral support. I can supply laughter. I can supply uh, all sorts of those things. Yeah, I mean that's uh yeah that, that's true. We start in Las Vegas at the Fountain Blue Resort. Where Richardson Hitchens picks up a decision, a controversial decision to Gustavo Limos, who gave him all he can handle. I personally thought Limos won seven to five. I've been, I would have been okay with a draw. One judge had it one seventeen, one eleven. I'm not even going to say his name because we don't. He doesn't deserve to be named on this great podcast. But damn, Richardson Hitchens was in tough. Damn, he was he was a little bit exposed. I hate to use that term, but. Dude, what did you see in that fight, and were you shocked that Lemos gave Hitchens all that he could handle? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm not that shocked because we really haven't seen um, Richardson Hitchens with someone of this kind of caliber, this kind of elf. The guys that really come forward, he's a banger, two-fisted South American Argentinians. We've seen a ton of these guys over the years, right? He's really, really tough guys. Um, come forward, two-fisted attack, aggressive, tough, durable. And Lemos was all that. And, you know, he had a little bit of craft, too. He wasn't just uh, a banger, but, um, you know, he knew what he needed to do. He was um, he was assertive with his style. He pushed forward. Uh, obviously, the much smaller guy, um, much, much shorter, didn't look quite as heavy as, as Richardson Hitchens, but, man, was he a fire plug. He was very, very strong coming forward, had a good game plan on what to do with a taller fighter, got to the inside very, very easily, which I was very surprised because Hitchens has a great jab. It is very, very sharp. It's very powerful. Um, but we must have no problem getting under it, getting inside of it. Um, you know, he, he slowed down at times, and that's where Hitchens was able to do some, do some damage with the jab. Um, but for the most part, I mean, it was just the all, all out pressure from, from Lemos. Um, yeah. Was I surprised? Yes, but not wildly so because then again, we haven't really seen Hitchens at that level with this kind of fighter. Um, but also I think, Lemos himself was a bit of a, a a bit of an enigma. We didn't know what he was going to be. We didn't know how good he was. Sometimes these Argentinians are awesome. Sometimes these South American guys are like really, really good. Look at Marcos Maidana. Look at um, Lucas Matisse. These guys who come up and yeah, their, their records are nice. They're sterling, whatever. But they fought a bunch of Argentinians and they come up here and then they actually turn out to be good too. I don't know if Lemos is that kind of guy. Um, he wasn't super impressive, but he did what he needed to do that night. Um, not enough in the, the judges' eyes, but uh, I was impressed. Yeah, I mean, Lemos' stock is, is sky high. I actually want to see him against some of these other guys at 140. We'll get to that in, in a second. Uh, but just from a number standpoint, Lemos outlanded Hitchens in power, 139 to 74. 
not a mathematician, but you know, that's almost two to one. He threw over 100 more punches. He was more active. The, the big differential uh, was in the jabs. Uh, almost 60 percent or 50, excuse me, 55 percent of Hitchens thrown punches were jabs were on the complete opposite for Lemos was throwing power shots. It was that type of fight where Hitchens was trying to control it with his jab. He was trying to stand and trade more and, and stand through the fire, which he did. I give him credit for that. But ultimately, I thought he lost the fight. If, if you know, at worst, a, a draw, a major step back for him. Because if you think about what's going on at 140 right now, this is a guy who is the IBF mandatory for Subriu Matias. Subriu Matias is now with Matchroom. Um, 140 is red hot right now, and Hitchens wants to put his name in the middle of that mix. Wants to get in there with the Devin Haney's and the Roly, excuse me, and the Pitbull Cruises and all the other champions at 140, Tiafimo Lopez, major step back for him. After the fight, they're asking him about Subriu Matias, and he's going, you know what, you know, I, I think I need one more fight. I think I need one more fight. Not a good look for him. Uh, a, a tough one for Hitchens. I was rooting for the kid, uh, but, man, he, he he doesn't have that that – that that last thing you're looking for, like that 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 power punch, that that last bit that you need to get a guy like Lemos out of there, that elite level. I'm, I think he's gonna have a hard time against some of the champs out there because he he did win, and he is technically a mandatory for for Subrio Matias. But I uh, mean, Matias would have his way with him. My number one issue is if you're gonna be a boxer. Listen, I'm a boxer. I was watching that fight. I was struggling to give him enough rounds to 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 be in the fight as a winner. And what was lacking for me was ring generalship. I just did not see that. I did not see right, any. He's a guy that has control. That's, that's his mo. It is and it isn't. His mo is that he keeps on the outside with his jab, and he's very good at that because he's a very good jab. Um, but then when you got a guy who can get past that jab at times, because he's never had that guy. He's never had a guy who can get past the jab. Now he gets a, a guy who gets past the jab, and the guy completely dictates where the fight is fought. That's what a ring general is. The fight was the fight was fought at the pace, the distance, and and at the behest of of. The, the Argentinian and not being able to control that distance, not being able to be a ring general. So when you do get on the inside, being able to, I mean, do anything other than just hold and just grab and clinch. Dude, That's one thing. Man. If you grab and clinch, you spin, you get back to the center, you get back to jabbing. That's yeah. what being a ring general is. Like, yeah, you, you, listen, I am not against clinching. I did it when I fought too, but I, I would clinch to get to a position, not clinch to wait for the ref to break us up. Yeah. I would clinch, spin, roll, boom, back to the outside. That's that's how you actually utilize an active clinch instead of just clinching and then waiting for the ref to step in. Uh, that's when you could lose points. So I'm surprising he didn't, honestly. He could have um, easily lost the points. Jab, jab, hold. Easily. Jab, jab, hold. You got to stop with the jab, jab, hold, man. It's it's a, it's almost like a plague taking over boxing. It's really the worst style. And it's not only was it jab, jab, hold, but it was any time Lemos got close and the guy started throwing punches, it was hold. You, you can't do that. You can't break the action just to just to clinch over and over and over again. And expect to you know to to win these decisions and, and have the fans like it. Yeah, that's the thing, man. I mean, we're, we're having the same conversation with Shakur Stevenson, and and uh, you know we talked about it last episode and got some blowback from uh, our our community and our listeners, where you know you gotta excite, you have to entertain. It's fine to do this. Like Hitchens can do this all day. He can jab, he can hold, and he can do that all day long. And Stevenson can do the same thing. He could circle around and not get hit. But are you going to reach your, your your earning potential? Are you going to entertain? Are you going to become a pay-per-view star? No, you're not. So, yeah, Hitchens can do this, and he can get away with his athleticism and and maybe a, a bad scorecard here or there. I don't want to get into the corruption part of the sport, but who, who knows it <laughs> when it, when you have uh, when you see a scorecard like that. But you got to entertain. you got to figure out a way not to hold, hold, hold. Not what to was it, 117, 111? Yeah. That's that's disgusting. It's criminal. That's gross. It's gross. It's criminal. It's criminal. And it, it gets it, it gets overshadowed because you look at the 114, 113, and you go, yeah, that's more likely what I saw. And then yeah. there's that throwaway line that the broadcast says, and kudos to Sergio and Chris for kind of saying it, like you know, not kind of. They flat out said like that's a horrible, horrible scorecard. You throw that line in there. It's now Sunday, Monday. We forget about it. That that judge doesn't even have to talk about it. That judge isn't even seen. That judge evaporates into the night of Las Vegas yep. and doesn't have to do it. Doesn't have to do an interview. Doesn't have to answer to anyone. Gets a nice check and is on to his next assignment. It's it's the worst part of the sport. Uh, the bad judging. It's it's it, and it's one judge, and it's always one right. And, and this is exactly why you hear Mauricio Suleiman trying to trot out six or seven judges. When no, how about just getting good judges? How about getting three good ones, not two and an eleven, not two good cards, 
and then one ridiculous. It's always one one eighteen, one ten, or one seventeen, one eleven. Like yeah, it's it's the guy or the girl who who literally makes their scorecard before they get to the arena. It's like yeah, the, it's always the A side. It's never it's never wide <laughs> right? for the underdog. Never wide for the underdog. It's always the A side. It's always super wide for the A side where everyone like goes, huh? Who saw that? It's literally never the underdog right. that they're and like, we, wow, we, look we, at that, we, look at that crazy scorecard. Bro, even if it was 117, 111 <laughs> Lemos, I would be saying that's that's absurd. Yeah. That's that's nine rounds it was to a close three. fight. That was not yeah, a nine I, that was not a nine rounds to three fight. Come on, man. Yeah. Like that's that's as bad. And I hate that you even spend time on it. But if you don't spend time on it and you just brush it aside, then like we always do. them. And then who's yeah. winning them? Because you're just talking into the abyss right now. I mean, it's, it's just that's what it I means. mean. Ultimately, Dan, we are we are speaking into the abyss anyway, because this is going to go nowhere. There's no teeth that is going to attack any of these judges and put them in their place. No, so, never, never. That's a whole show. That's a whole show in itself. Yeah, absolutely. So Richard Hitchinson, Richardson Hitchens wins. He is now the IBF mandatory or stays the IBF mandatory for Subrio Matias. I don't see him running towards Matias. Uh, I see him. You know, he literally said, I need another fight, which you yeah, do. If you're in a mandatory position, you, you pray, that. you pray to get into a mandatory. You pray to get eliminators. You cannot get on the mic afterwards. They'd be like, I need another fight. It's not yeah. up to you, bro. <laughs> that's not, that's not how it works. I was shocked by that because this is a guy that was saying a lot of stuff beforehand. He yeah. was saying, I'm stealing money from Eddie Hearn. Uh, this is going to be a whitewashing. I'm going to show him he's on the same level. <laughs> this is a guy that's like begging for the spotlight or uh, like, hey, 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 put me in your discussions at 140. Hey, hey, I, I'm at 142 and I, I'm, I'm pretty damn good. Afterwards, you know, you got to say I want Matias. At least say that, you know, and mm-hmm. then behind the scenes say, okay, um, I'm clearly not ready for a Subriel Matias, but Hitchens gets the win, and uh, we move on. Co-main event, Diego Pacheco was in very tough with uh, Sean McCallman. Uh, good call on your part. Uh, you. McCallman was tough. I, I picked 7 through 12. I should honestly get my money back because it was a 10-round fight. Draft Kings had 7 through 12. <laughs> I want my money back. I'm going to email uh, technicality, I want my money back. I'm going to email DraftKings and uh, my guy there and say, hey, what the hell? Uh, but Pacheco didn't look great. I think you need these types of fights, though. You need a Sean McCallum on your record. Uh, a tricky guy, a powerful guy, uh, an elusive guy. Pacheco needs to jab, man. Where is his jab? He's loading up on everything. Gets the win. He figures him out. I did think he win. I did think he won the fight. But, man, he he he, he took a, we took a little bit of a step back. I mean, he poured a little bit of cold water on what was a red hot contender in Diego Pacheco. It's the first time he's looked human, honestly. I mean, he, up until now, he looked like an absolute world beater um, in every way, shape, and form. And he had someone in front of him. I, you know, I, I told you. I told you McCallum could fight. I told you he was smart. He was athletic. Um, he's a physically strong guy. Uh, he's very confident in himself. He had a good game plan. He's very good at slowing down the pace, which is exactly what you need to do with Pacheco. And, um, yeah, I mean, listen, like you said, I, I agree with you entirely. Again, He needs fights like this. The, every guy on their way up needs fights like this. You need to be pushed. You need to... See the reason why you need to step up because that's the thing. You have to step up every time. Step up, step up, step up. Um, and if you're just having your way with everyone, you're like, yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But this gives you an idea that, you know what, got to keep working. And I think that's ultimately going to be a good thing for Pacheco. I think Pacheco is world class. I do believe he's going to be a world champion. I do believe he's going to be around for a long time. Um, but this is a little bit of a sign to say, hey, man, you got to keep you got to keep getting better. You got to keep improving. Uh, if you want to be the guy that you're supposed to be. Get back to the drawing board, but get back to work. Uh, Berlanga tweeted, Pacheco is ass. And I was like, dude, he'd still beat wow. you. He'd still beat you with that aggressive. performance. Yeah, very aggressive. He'd still beat he, Like you said, super ass. Um, he'd still beat you, uh, Pacheco. I, I, I like Pacheco Berlanga. Uh, if, it means, if it means that Pacheco didn't look good, it gets Berlanga to get into the ring with him. That's a real crossroads types of uh, fight that you get at that level. I would be shocked if Berlanga would do that because he still thinks he's in the running for Canelo Alvarez and, and, and all that. But that's the latest at, at 168. That was um, the fight Saturday night. You also had Scott Nicholson winning a vacant world title uh, and then called out Amanda Serrano once again. Don't think she's getting Amanda Serrano because from what I've seen, Amanda Serrano is potentially fighting Katie Taylor early June, and they're talking about doing it at the Las Vegas Sphere. I love everything about that sentence I just said right there. I I love that fight. I don't understand why Serrano didn't go right for the rematch with Taylor and vice versa after their unbelievable fight in April of 2022. I thought it was next June. So when I read that originally, I was blew it off. But apparently it's this June. 
Uh, so I don't think Scott Nicholson gets Serrano. I think Serrano's big game fishing right now. She's going for like the biggest names possible, uh, biggest arenas possible. And Katie Taylor versus Serrano, just like, duh. I mean, that's the easy rematch. No, she's at legacy money making fights, Serrano. She's not looking to fight the the next up and coming, uh, whatever you want to call Sky Nicholson. I, <laughs> I, I I don't I don't see that. I don't see that Serrano making that move. Um, she's looking for legacy fights. She's looking for big money fights. Um, uh, yeah, it's not I a mean, bad fight. It's not a bad fight. Sky Nicholson. It's not, but it does nothing for Serrano, and that's and, and that's Serrano's point too. She's like, all right, little little kid, I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. Um, and she's got big, big, big opportunities out there. You know, um, she's, you know, obviously the Katie Taylor fight. I, I like the Baumgartner fight with Serrano. That's another fight that's very possible. I know Baumgartner is chasing Clarissa Shields. Tell me you pounds, saw, tell me you saw, their, up. tell me you saw their little, like, of course thing. I did. Yeah. Yeah, of course. That was of course. some of the cringiest stuff I've ever seen. I mean, listen, it started on air, which was crazy. You have, we have Clarissa literally calling the fight. And then they interview Baumgartner, and she like calls her out on the air, and then and then Clarissa has to come back at her while on air, like as a commentator. Um, that's cringy as hell and unprofessional. And then you know the whole thing afterwards, just two of them barking at each other back and forth. Here's the uh, thing, guy. Like I have no problem with drama. But people love it. A lot of a lot of clicks. No, a lot of clicks. I don't know. That's not, well. <laughs> I, I was just about to say, do people love it because they've been going at each other for a few months now, and no one is blinking. Like no one is buying it. No one like they're separated by me- multiple weight classes. It's just like you know, Baumgartner has this. She hasn't really washed away the PED yeah. accusations, and I know she's exonerated. According to her, she did. According to right. her, she did. Right. I know she's exonerated and all that, but everyone is just like, nah, I don't know. And Shields is 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 Shields. I mean, she's a lightning rod. I, I think she's damn good. But yeah, I, that was weird. And did you also see David Benavidez? Good gracious. They like they put him on the screen. They interview him. He's drunk as a skunk, bro. Wasted. I thought he had like dental issues. I thought he just had a root canal. He, he couldn't even get the words out to the point where today he issued like an apology. I'm so sorry. I was drunk. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I can appreciate him being, being honest. <laughs> I know. I was like, I had, I had a, you know, I had a root canal the day before. Sorry. Yeah, but he said no. Like, I have it here. It wasn't even like, um, you know, like some PR thing. It was right from his, um, Instagram, and it it was just like very, like, like a fighter. Oh, does he still have it up? Oh, here. I I just want to take this time to apologize to all my fans and to the people that seen me last night drunk. (laughs) <laughs> I had one too many drinks and made a complete fool of myself. Shaking my head, this will never happen again. All right, bro, well, you got drunk. Here's like you, you, your 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 stock is so high in the boxing world. Uh, maybe outside of the the Canelo hardcores who, who think Canelo can do no wrong. Yeah, you got drunk at a fight. Listen, we've all we've all done that. You're a professional boxer. Like some of the drunkest people I've ever seen are professional boxers. So, what I thought that was kind of funny. I just couldn't believe that the zone like or Mannix didn't like see his state of mind. And then uh, be like, okay, let's not let's not put him on the air. Or his, maybe his wife maybe could have stepped in and been like, honey, you're a little drunk. I don't think you should go on the air. Uh, yeah, I, I, listen. I, <laughs> yeah, obviously it should it should have uh, should have been should have not happened at all. But at, at the same time, I, I appreciate the honesty in the in, in the uh, in the apology, and that just shows you what kind of guy he is. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's impressive. Hey, man, I was drunk. Sorry, I'm sorry, he everybody. Found blue. He just, he was hanging out with Oscar early in the day. They had a photo op. I would like these Oscar meetings with these fighters that he has zero ties to. Like, what is he saying to them? What is Oscar saying? To oh, I think he guys? tweeted something like, or he posted it too. He's like, oh, my guy, whatever. Like, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know how really close they are, but listen, it's Oscar, dude. Listen, you're a fighter. I know. I know. I mean, we're, you and I are the same era, but like Oscar the, was the man. I know a lot of these new guys only know him as a promoter, like these younger guys. But, you know, in our, our era, he was he was the golden boy. He was the... Uh, the best around for a long time, and he was the he was the, the you know the, the golden goose as well. So um, I think for some for a lot of these fighters coming up, it's like that's ah, Oscar man. He's a, he's a he's an idol. Yeah, so, Fimo went there too. I, I think you get that call from him, and you don't you don't say no because that's the one thing Oscar has going for him as a promoter. It's like listen, you know I've been there, done that. I've been in the ring. I've been mm-hmm. in your shoes. You know where Eddie Hearn has not, where you know Al Heyman has not, where Bob Marum has not. Clearly, Bob Arum is not a boxer. Imagine Bob Arum in the ring with trunks on. That would. But be- even 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 by today's standards, I don't. The only fighter who can say they've touched the kind of things that Oscar has done is Canelo. 
Like yeah. we we I think I think you you young guys forget how big of a deal Golden no, Golden Boy was. was. He was Oscar was everything. He was a a living legend. He was a god amongst amongst men. Go watch his uh, documentary on HBO. It's one of the strangest tell all. Take take back the curtains. Is that a phrase? Uh, no. Uh, open pull the back. curtains. Pull, pull back. back. Thank pull you. Pull back. Thank you. Pull, pull back, back the, the curtains. The curtains um, on Oscar, but it also showed how big he was in the mid nineties. Early 2000s. Um, let's get into what happened at 154. I didn't watch this fight, Chris. I don't know who this guy is. I'm not going to lie. I follow boxing like a devout freak, but I don't know Bakram Murlatazliev, but he is now a champion at 154 pounds, a legitimate world champion. He stopped Jack Kolke. Uh, he is That was the IBF crown that was vacated by Jermel Charlo. The guy was been a number one contender for like five years. He took, I think, six or seven step-aside fees. Finally wow. found finally found a guy that maybe I could beat. I think I could beat Jack Kolke. I'm going to not take a step aside fee, and I'm going to fight for a vacant title. Happy for main events. They have a piece of, of um, Mauro Tezliev. Happy for Kathy Duva and everyone at main events. They're, they are awesome. Um, but now at 154, this guy's in the mix. Like, he's got a world title. Like, if, if they, someone wants to become undisputed at 154, whether it's Fundora or whether it's Madrimov, they're going to fight Mauro Tezliev. Yeah, I, I don't know him, and I look like I met I've met him. I, I, I he he looks familiar. I know I've met him uh, either at fights or or somewhere along my travels, but um, have never seen him fight. But I know Jack Colke is really really tough, and mm-hmm. for him to stop him, um, even at this stage of Jack Colke's career, it's like this kid has to, has to be able to fight. Yeah. So. Um, and the, even even by looking at the scorecards, like you said, I, I didn't watch it either. He was way ahead. You, could, you, couldn't, um, you couldn't watch it if you wanted to. It was like impossible to find. One of these one of these lunatics on Twitter found a link to it, and I okay. skimmed, I skimmed through it. Uh, yeah. So actually, no, he wasn't way ahead. I'm sorry. He, he was actually it was split. Yeah. Um, but he was way ahead on one scorecard. But he was he was winning the fight and then stopped them in the eleventh. So, um, you know, listen, the guy can obviously fight. Yeah, 54 absolutely. is kind of a weird division now. Bro, that's, you know? why, that's why I wanted to give an update because we didn't talk about it on our last show, like what's going on with 54. So the latest is Sebastian Fundora has the two belts, right? He just beat Tim Zhu. But he has a broken nose, and he can't fight until September at the earliest. There's interviewed, this- uh, we interviewed um, uh, Samson on ProBox TV. He said November. Okay. He said he won't be fighting till November. All right, makes sense. I mean, these guys fight twice a year. For a broken nose, I don't, I don't understand. But. It doesn't matter. Even if he was healthy, he's fighting in November because of just the schedule of these guys fight. So Fandora uh, has got the two belts, broken nose, not fighting till November. Uh, there was a big thing about the rematch clause, verbal rematch clause. Uh, Spence gets into the ring. Fundora Spence seems like the thing. Then Samson goes, you know what? I'm a man of my word. We shook hands. Who am I without my word? All I have is my balls and my word. He didn't say that last part. I made that up. Um, and then Tim Zhu uh, says, you know, I will, uh, you know, we'll have a rematch at the end of the year. Zhu's getting over the cup. So that's like as of right now. I still don't believe it whatsoever. A uh, handshake agreement means nothing to me. I don't care what you say, Samson. If they offer Spence and a boatload of cash in November – that's the fight. He didn't or say Crawford. when or Crawford. They didn't say when the the rematch would be. They said, "Yeah, we'll give you a rematch. It could be after Spence. It could be two years from now. It could that's, be ten years." That's from the now. key, there, Dan. You're a smart guy. I figured it out finally. It could be way down the line, and and that's the part. Not to rehash uh, how silly Team Team Zoo is. Um, yeah, that's the, the latest with that. And then Spence is in the mix. And then I heard a rumor. I saw it on Twitter. It's got to be true. Uh, got Terrence, to be. Got to be. Terrence Crawford potentially fighting Israel Mandramov, who is the WBA, one of the champions at 154 in Saudi Arabia. So when you f- we first spoke about this, I was like, what? who cares? Oh, money. <laughs> so I was like, why, why, why would this fight? Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, money. Well, um, money, and it's also a title. Yep. It's also a really not an easy fight. Madrimov is no, really not good. an easy fight at all. Yeah. Madrimov is really, really good. Crawford is really, really good. I saw Crawford's agent, who I met uh, earlier this year in MSG at the top rank fight. His name is um, Ish Hinson. Awesome guy. A real star in the, uh, the sports agency. He works with CAA. He negotiated the fight with uh, Crawford and Spence. Guy's cool as hell. 
I saw him last night sitting next to Eddie Hearn uh, in Las Vegas. Who's Eddie Hearn uh, promote? Mind your mouth. Yes. Uh, I'm not mad at that fight. Like I, I would Crawford's like the odd man out at 154. He's obviously not going to fight Fundora. We're not going to wait for Crawford to fight until November. That would be, I mean, I'm sure Crawford would love to wait until November. But Crawford, Majumov, and Saudi with a title on the line, and Crawford wins that. He's got a, a piece of the 154. I don't hate Crawford, Majumov at all. Just like you said, yeah, it is just weird. Like never in a million years did I think that that would be a fight. But the more you think about it and you peel it back, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, especially when you walk it out like that, it, it does make sense. I mean, you got Saudi money, you've got a, a title opportunity, you've got the other title list um, is out until November. And listen, Terrence Crawford, say what you will, Father Time is ticking, and he doesn't. It doesn't stop ticking. So yeah. he's got to get active. He's got to get busy. Um, it's coming up on a year since he fought. So. Yeah, he's got he's got to get busy. He's got to make some moves. So, this this is uh this looks like it's going to be the next move. And and, and it th- when you really look past it, it makes it does make sense. Yeah, it's a move, and and Crawford will be active. And I always love watching Crawford fight. But the thing though with Saudi is it's not they very rarely do one off deals. So does that mean Crawford going to fight a few times in Saudi Arabia? I would not be shocked. Uh, that guy is cashing in now uh, in the later part of, uh, of his career. Win, lose, or draw, they bring everybody back. So whoever they whoever they actually bring into the fold, they fight. <laughs> yeah, everyone gets a piece of that pie. Um, I want a piece of that pie. Let's get into 135 pounds. We're gonna, uh, we did a fun little thing last week where we did a deep dive into 140. Everyone seemed to like it. Got a request uh, from one of our, our listeners. Hey, why don't you do one into 135? But also added a little wrinkle. I put a form out on uh, social media, a questionnaire. Thank you to everyone who filled it out uh, about the lightweight division. And we're going to go through it right now, Chris. 135 uh, is one of the better divisions in boxing. It's not the mm-hmm. best division. because that it, was, it was recently. It was. It was the most promising division for a while. It was the best division for a while. But a couple guys have moved up. A couple guys have gotten old. A couple guys at 135 aren't giving us the fights that we want to see. I'm talking about you, Tank Davis. But let's get into it. Uh, the champions are Javante Davis, WBA champion. Uh, that happened end of last year. WBC champion, Shakur Stevenson. The IBF champion is vacant, but Lomachenko and Cambosos are fighting May 12th in Australia to settle that. The WBO is also vacant from Devin Haney, and that's going to be settled by Emmanuel Navarrete and Baranchik. So that's the champions. Now, who is the best at 135 pounds? According to our community, 44% say Javante Davis, 37% say Shakur Stevenson. To me, yes, Javante Davis is the cream of the crop at 135. Interesting. Interesting to hear the fans speak. Um, yeah, but are Wait, we going to say, Chris, what are you trying to say? Oh, I'm say. trying to say, are we going to see Javante? I'm not, not even talking about the fans. Fans. Cool. I like, I like what you guys, <laughs> your heads are at. Um, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm posing a question. Does it take Javante out of the mix? Because you're not going to see him fight anybody. Like, is it, it's looking more and more like we're, we're just, we're never going to see him fight. Anyone I disagree. That we want. I know. We and I go back and forth on this. Yes, we put heads on this. It's fine. Listen, uh, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. You know, looks like a duck. You know, it's it's, it's a duck. The guy, the guy does not fight anybody. That he, listen, it's it's got to be on his side of the street, like the Frank Martin fight. It's got to be, you know, um, I don't know. I, I, it's got to be a Ryan Garcia type because it doesn't look like he, he's there to make the fights that the fans want to see. I mean, he's not getting younger. So I mean, he's not thirty; he's twenty-eight. But I know what you're saying. I, there's, there's. If you haven't done it at this point, he's been he's been at the top for how many I years? I know. There's a, there's a stack of evidence to support your case. I'm not even saying that you're wrong. It's right there in front of our eyes. It's pretty damn cut and dry. He hasn't given us the the fights ex- that we're exactly clamoring for. He's given us some good fights. He's given us some great <laughs> knockouts. He's given us some opponents. That- Roy Jones Jr.'s knock during his prime was he didn't have anybody to fight. And he fought all the guys that are around him. And yeah. you have to keep your hat to him. He would 
have prayed for an opportunity like Tank Davis does. Okay. Tank Davis has been surrounded by guys that he could fight yes. to make legacy type fights, huge he money. Could have fought, he could have fought Lomachenko. And we've we've ago. through all of them. We've through all of them. I get it. I get it. But I truly believe, and I'm basing this off of nothing. <laughs> I'm basing it off of. <laughs> I'm basing this. I'm basing this off of how Floyd moved. I'm hoping a prayer. I'm hoping a prayer. I'm basing it off of how Floyd moved his career. Basing it off of some you know tea leaves and some things I've heard from LRB and some things I've heard from PBC people is that this has all been calculated to get to this point. I don't want to spend too much time on this because we just had this very same conversation a few episodes ago. I do think he will, he will fight the bigger names because there you, you, you just can't find any more of these guys for the next five, six years. He's 28 years old. He's, you know, he's got five good, good years left in him twice a year. That's 10 fights. I don't think you can find no offense to Frank Martin, the Frank Martins of the world nine more times after this. I think he's at the point where he's going to cash in now. And that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. The evidence is there that he hasn't fought anyone yet. But damn, there's a lot of opponents for him to fight. But I think he's, you say he's cash in. I'm saying cash out. I'm t- I'm saying that they're looking at it's going to be less than five years. I'm saying that they're looking at they're trying to ride this undefeated streak for as long as they can. And then when it's about time to get out, kind of like the Charlos, similar thing. I mean, willing to sell them out, they can fight whoever now. Yeah. Now that now they can fight anybody, and they're going to make big, 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 know. big, massive money. I, but, I don't know. I, I agree. Like he, he could fight literally anyone and he's, it's going to sell out and it's going to be a, like a $20 million gate. It's unbelievably impressive. Um, the fans fun. that he's show a fun up, fighter. we all, really we all, fun. we all love him when he fights. So I love, I would favor him over all, all these guys. That's the thing. Like, and you know, earlier on a couple of years ago, I was, I was getting flack from everyone on, on social media because I, I didn't exactly know if he was the real deal or not. He is the real deal. Like he can, no, we, we've, we've been pretty, we've been pretty, uh, I'm talking like pre, Pre you hopping on this podcast, like oh. I had one clumsy tweet a while back that like these freaking guys just bring up all the time. And LRB got on me. And LRB had a two year beef. It just, yeah, man, like I just didn't know if if Davis was elite yet. This was three years ago. I made I just questioned it, and he is like he is. He we've been very we've been very positive about him on our show. Right, right. And right. and aside from even his skill set, just how funny he is to, to watch. And He's awesome. we're he, yeah. He's, absolutely, he's, absolutely. He's amazing. He's amazing. His his fights are events. June twenty second uh, is supposed to be in Houston, Texas, against Frank Martin. Going to be electric. Which I like. I like that fight. I do like yeah. that fight. Yeah. So let me give you my top five at one hundred and thirty five pounds. I have Tank Davis number one. I got Shakur Stevenson number two. I have hard punching Mexican star William Zapata at number three. At number four, out of respect. And just the fact that there isn't a lot of big names at 135 anymore. Vasily Lomachenko. And rounding out my top five, I this was a tough one for me. I, I was going through a few of the names, but I'm going with Frank Martin just because I think he's done a little bit more than some of the other names at 135. What's your top five at, at 135? Number one, I got Shakur because at the end of the day. Over when you're Tank. Doing, yes, because he beats him. He beats Tank. Yeah. Okay. I think I like the best that. version. I think the best version of Shakur beats Tank, and um, ch- ch- number two is Tank. Very very close, but l- listen, we're splitting hairs. But I, I got I got I got Shakur over Tank. I think stylistically, I think it's a boring fight. I don't think a lot of punches get thrown. But at the end of the day, I think I think uh, Shakur is able to minimize the offense of Tank long enough to win the fight. Um, number three. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go number three. I'm gonna go still, even though he's an old man, quote unquote. You know, I like the old guys. I'm going Lomachenko. Okay. No, number four, Zapata, and number five, I'm going Raymond Murataya. That's who even I was th- debating on five. Yeah, even though he looked he didn't look great last time out. Um, he had a tough night, but I think he is exceptional. He also wasn't fighting at his weight class. Um, he was fighting up. I think a thirty-seven or something like that, just to make the make the fight or whatever. Um, so I think I think at his weight class, I think when he's in his, his own weight class, which is one thirty-five, I think he is very very talented. He's got a long way to go. He had a tough night. So what? It's supposed to, you're supposed to have fights like that. He hasn't had one in a while, so it's it's good on him. But yeah, Frank Martin's right there. Um, Keyshawn Davis is right there as well. I think he'd be just outside the top five. Mm-hmm. I think he's I think he is a uh, really really fantastic um, future star. But yeah, I'm going. Shakur, Davis, Loma, Zapata, Morataya. Like it. 
Like that list a lot. Uh, the weight class, it's, it's a it's a very very solid weight class, and you can mix around a lot of those guys, and it's it's still very uh, a very good. Right, you uh, have star plot. power at the top. You have yep. star power at the top. You have you have elite at the top. You have William Zapata, who is in a class super of fun, own, oh, class of man. his own, super fun. Yeah, and you got the grizzled vet in Lomachenko. You got the upcoming guys in in Andy Cruz and uh, Keyshawn Davis. Oh, I forgot about uh, Andy Cruz. Andy Cruz yeah. is excellent. We'll get yep. to him in a second. Uh, Ram, Raymond Murataya. Um, there's a lot of names in this division, and you got Cambosos in there too. Even though I think he's going to get waxed by Long yeah, Chico. he's. I, I think at this point uh, he's more of a namesake, and yeah. um, but and I, I don't think he's got that much left in him, honestly. And then you also have Emmanuel Navarrete, but I don't really look at him as a lightweight just yet. I got to see how he looks against Baranchik on uh, May 18th. Um, yeah, I, I I can't have him. I couldn't even have him in the top 10, honestly, no, until I, no. I see him there. Fun? This this is, what, fourth weight class, third weight class? Yeah. And he was looking small at 30, so I don't know how he's going to look at 35. Yeah, so we'll get into – that's our top five. We'll get into what the best matchup is. Now, obviously, 63% of our – Listeners said Tank versus Shakur is the best matchup, even though, like you said, it could be a dud because Tank throws under 30 punches around. Shakur is a defensive first fighter, could be staring at each other for the first five, six rounds. Uh, but that's the fight that I think would would be electric in terms of power punching, most accurate power puncher versus the sport's best defender in Shakur Stevenson. I don't think we get it anytime soon unless Shakur leaves top rank and comes to PBC. And then we can build towards that next year. But Tank Davis versus Shakur Stevenson, man, that's that would be something to watch. I um, <clears throat> I I like, and this is this might be a weird pick. I like Shakur and Lomachenko. I think the the, the tactical technicians, um, and as much as Shakur tends to slow fights down, Loma speeds them up, and I think that their 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 dynamic would be interesting. And also Loma. Aging, aging champion, right? Aging fighter. Um, things change. You get older. You kind of have to fight more. You have to push more. It happened to me in my career. I had to. I had to be more aggressive. I had to be more of a stalker. And you're seeing that Lomachenko, like with that Devin Haney fight, he became much more of a stalker, move forward type guy. And I think he tried to do the same thing with Shakur because yeah. he wants to put. He pushes the pace. He wants to. He wants to get up, 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 so he can he can uh, take advantage with his awkwardness and his and his uh, virtuoso style. I like that fight. I think that's. I think that would be. The fight where we would see the best version of Shakur, where he'd be forced to fight um, and it pushed beyond a limit that he's ever been pushed. And, and I that think could that happen. Yeah, like, absolutely. This absolutely could, could happen. This fight could happen at the end of the year. Like, yes. I, I know the top rank is kind of controls the 135 division right now. Uh, the two vacant title fights have to play out. It could see they're going to be Navarrete versus Lomachenko if they win. Or it's I don't know be- who wants to see that. Or it's going to Mexican, be Navarrete so versus Shakur, or it's going to be, or it's going to be Lomachenko versus Shakur. What do you think about this fight? Zapata Davis. That got seven percent of our vote, which was, you know, sixty-three percent of it went to Tank Shakur. So some of it had to be splintered out. Tank versus Zapata would be crazy. Dude, because I, I think about because I watched it the other day getting ready for the Rollies fight. Um, I watched Rollie Tank. And Roley's physicality gave Tank issues, and it made him kind of bolt, button up, keep his holster, keep his gun holstered, and look for the openings. Um, and Zapita, way better fighter than Roley's in every way, and is it throws way more punches. I think he, I think he hits harder. Um, I think he's more durable. I, I think it's a fun fight. Yeah, it would be awesome. I, I mean, I don't. Once again, this fantasy world we're living in with these fights, but. Um, technically, Zapata is the WBA number one ranked uh, fighter or mandatory for Tank's title, even though Tank has never once fought a mandatory. And that's the biggest reason why he doesn't like belts, is because he doesn't want to fight mandatory. So he wants to figure out the biggest event to be made. But yeah, that would be sick fight. Um, 15% want to see Tank versus Loma. That was a, a dream fight for years. It started in like 2017 when Lomachenko was still at the height of his powers. And Tank won his first title off of Jose Cepeda. And we were starting to understand who, not Jose Cepeda, Jose Pedraza. And we were starting to understand who Tank was, that this guy is the real deal. This guy's power puncher. Put him in there with the technician of Lomachenko. We're now in 2024. The fight hasn't happened. <laughs> and I don't see it happening anytime soon. Um, that would be a fun one. But, yeah, there's a lot of mixing and matching. You could do Loma, Shakur. we probably get that fight. Tank, Cepeda, 7%. Uh, any of these matchups at 135, we would gladly take as fight fans. Uh, who is the wild card of 135? 
this is interesting because I only put three options. I put Andy Cruz, Keyshawn Davis, Raymond Morataya. These are the names that were not in our top five. These are the names that aren't you don't exactly list off when you think of lightweight. Sixty percent of our community says Andy Cruz is the wild card of the lightweight division, and I agree. The guy we have is very, very smart listeners. That's awesome. I agree. I agree. Sixty percent, twenty-six percent say Keyshawn Davis. Fifteen yep. percent say uh, Raymond Morataya. Yeah, Andy Cruz. You put him in there with any of these guys, he's giving them hell. I agree. Andy, Andy Cruz is the guy. As soon as you said that, who's who's the wild card? Said Andy Cruz. Um, I think we've seen the least of him. Obviously, we've seen the least of him as a pro. Uh, but I think his his boxing IQ is on a, such a high level already, even for a, mm-hmm. even even a pro level. Um, yeah, we just don't, we just don't know. And that's what a wild cards are about, all about. So I, th- I think, yeah, man, our fans, our fans are sharp, man. Our listeners are sharp. I am super impressed with you guys. Well, well done. Well done. Yeah, this is really cool. And this is something we're going to keep doing on every weight class. Um, now that we got this, this questionnaire, adds a whole new wrinkle to it. It's not just us flapping our gums. Uh, we get our listeners in there and, and, and get their thoughts too. Lastly, I asked who will be the top dog in, in three years. Now I, I messed up. I should have put, one of the guys, I should have put either Shakur or Tank in there just to be like, all right, they're, they're going to stay at 135. Uh, maybe they'll fight each other and one will reign supreme. Um, but I put Andy Cruz, Davis, Murataya, the same thing as the wild card. And this is who will be the top dog in three years. And 56% say Andy Cruz, 40% say Keyshawn Davis. So uh, our listeners at least think that Andy Cruz can uh, has a little bit more than, than Keyshawn Davis. And that's the debate that's starting to form. You know, there's always got to be the next big fight at 135 or 140. You know, you build up between two guys that are just kind of at the same level, just starting their careers. And that's Andy Cruz and Keyshawn Davis. They fought in the amateurs in the gold medal uh, bout, so they have that that history. Keyshawn Davis fights like a professional fighter. He fights different. He has a different style than Andy Cruz, which makes it even more uh, exciting. And then Davis coming off of that win over Pedraza. Yeah, Pedraza's a little long in the tooth, but he stopped him, and he he didn't even didn't even play around with them. And Cruz is going the distance with guys, and Cruz is showing that kind of amateur style. So this is the next one. This is the next one we're all going to build towards is Cruz and Davis. Yeah, and I, I and also those two guys, I don't see them or either one of them outgrowing the weight class anytime soon. I think they're thirty five pounders. It's not yeah, like it's hard. It's hard to say what, like who's going to be so-and-so in three or five years or whatever because so many guys skip weight class especially 35 it just seems like it's a weight class that people don't spend a lot of time at um but i think the two of them just from body size and where they're at i think they're, they're both going to be there i think yeah in three years those are going to be the guys and i think they're building towards a huge fight um in the next couple of years and I'm, I'm i'm here for it i mean i think uh, i think their boxing iq gets better as, the, as they go in, in the pros um and really great point Dan about Keyshawn, the way he fights as a pro now versus how Andy Cruz is fighting. But again, Cruz was, yeah, this is two, two pro fights, three, 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 four, maybe even. Uh, yeah. So uh, definitely these guys are moving very, very fast in the pro ranks. Um, and I think their development, uh, we're going to see a lot of their development in the next couple of years, but yeah, as those two meeting down the line, I mean, it's so far off cause we got so much to do every year. I have so much happen, but I think that's a really, um, Really interesting future fight to, to think about. And again, good job with the fans, man. These guys, these guys rock. Yeah, good job, everyone out there. Thank you for filling this out. Um, it's a healthy division. But we, now that we spent some time talking about it, it's got a lot of names at the top. It's got these up and comers tor- at the bottom that we want to see eventually fight. It's got great role players. It's got you know the the legendary fighters like Lomachenko, and you throw in some fun fighters like Cepeda. I mean, this is a really really fun division. The titles have opened up a little bit because of Devin Haney vacating those those belts. We're going to see a lot of we're going to get a lot of answers, I should say, um, towards the next couple of months because two of the belts will be figured out, and that's the IBF belt and the WBO belt. And then you have Javanta with one title, and you have Shakur uh, with the other one. So we'll get. We'll hey, get Dan, quick, quick, quick question: When do we stop looking at Cepeda as? not just being a fun guy and being a really dangerous top guy because he's really looking have. more he's looking more and more like he's elite dude and i I, I, th- I think he's though he could be a, easily be a wild card i should have put him in that list yeah i agree i agree i think um that last i was really impressed maxi hughes is, is a tough out and he's got a lot of experience against good guys um and has never been dominated the way that he was uh by by zapeta zapeta is something else man I, and yeah, I know. Stylistically, he seems like he's a kind of a one-dimensional guy, 
Um, but I think that was a question that I, I, I posed going into the Max Hughes fight. It's like, yeah, you can't just be a one-dimensional guy and deal with a guy like Max Hughes. You've got to be able to close that distance in a certain way and have some have some IQ behind it to get in on a guy like that. And he did, and he had no problem doing it. So I think it shows that uh, he's uh, that fight especially shows he's a lot better than maybe initially we thought or we've been we've been mentioning. But yeah, no, he's he's entering that top elite level at a very good in a very good weight class i'm really curious to see how he pans out the next couple fights yeah i I think you're right i think there's a when you think of him you think of a lot of punches and when you think of a lot of punches you think of a brawler but he's a lot of of openings yeah now yeah he's so much more than that he's legit and i think that all the fans boxing fans (laughs) saw that in that last fight he's definitely the most exciting at 135 if we had that category for you uh he's pure excitement he's must he's entered the must watch territory uh, William Cepeda, it's awesome. I, I think boxing needs. Yeah, that. I think he was he was on he was on our uh, most exciting, exciting fighters. Yeah. yeah, he was on our most exciting list. I think I think across the board, he would be that guy. Yep. All right, that's our show this uh, for this early portion of the week. We'll have another show later on in the week to preview Jared Anderson. Week. Jared Anderson, top rank has a card this weekend. Uh, we'll talk about the heavyweight division. It'll give us a look at the Jared Anderson's mindset. Uh, coming off of some crazy legal issues, is he still the guy? Is he still the man at 135? Uh, 135 is on my mind. Is he still the guy at heavyweight? As the he has been 135 since he was 11 years old. Yeah, I think he came out of the womb at 135. At 135. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Keep your hands up at all times. Protect yourselves at all times. Let's survive an eclipse, and we'll see you later in the week.